What makes us modern? We know that modern means technology, industry, cities, cars, but might there be a modern attitude, a modern psychology? What differentiates us from pre-moderns? Can we even imagine what a traditional outlook might feel like? Traditional life was circular. We were tied to the land day after day, month after month. The idea of improvement or of relationships socially with the outside world, people that weren't there, that had different ideas, was largely non-existent. How did we get from this to this? The philosophers of the Enlightenment, Kant, Marx, Mill, Bacon, were motivated by a powerful idea that we could rationally understand the world and use the world to shape our own history. They were all in varying ways about ordering the world, putting things in their place, making it predictable, usable. So what makes up this modern attitude, this attitude and psychology that's in all of us? Think about a world before clocks, before maps and zip codes, before calendars and timetables. What would it have been like? Well, time and space were one and the same. They were intertwined. The sun went up, you moved to the field and began to plough. Life was predictable, circular. Each day was largely the same. The clock changed this. The clock disconnected time from space. It represents time abstractly. It's standardised time so that it's the same for everyone. A map does something similar. It represents space in a universally recognisable way. The sociologist Anthony Giddens calls this the separation of space and time. Clocks, maps, rulers and calendars mean people can think more precisely about when and where, then share that information with others. It means you can communicate with other people in a way they can understand. What's significant about this? Well, we can plan with each other. We can synchronize our activities. For the pre-moderns, planning and synchronization were difficult. You could roughly say when the sun's at its highest or in four days from now, but these modern inventions were a game changer. They make time, and location, communicable, universalizable, and standardized. The cartographers, explorers, colonizers and printers of the Enlightenment produced maps on a grand scale. The British Navy won the battle to define time zones. Like clocks, this removed place from its physical location and represented it so it was communicable to all. Our modern understanding of geography, history, science with dates, times and other measurements is only possible if we can communicate those things to one another in a universally agreed way. These things, more than anything else, allow us to understand one another and plan with each other. I can only organise transport and building, for example, if I can communicate times of arrival and point to where we should meet. Trains only make sense if I know what time they're leaving, when they're coming back and where the stations are. 
As clocks were developed, medieval merchants began using them in town squares with bells to call others to market or labourers to work. Medieval cartographers had been more interested in experiencing locations from many angles so that they could illustrate a location truthfully. Ratios and measurements weren't important to them. Only with the Enlightenment do we find a concern with a single objective perspective. An ordered grid and a specific ratio meant coordinates could be fixed in place and distances accurately measured. This was the period when the Mercator map, the world map as we know it today, was first produced. Military leaders paid fortunes for accurate maps. An author said she saw Rockefeller bent over a map and with military precision planned the capture of strategic locations on the map of East Coast oil refineries. Balloon travel and photography of the earth from the air shattered people's subjective perceptions of the world. Radio compressed time and space so that people everywhere could listen to the same thing. As time and space compressed in on itself, Flaubert became fascinated by the implications for art. He wrote, Everything should sound simultaneously. One should hear the bellowing of the cattle, the whispering of the lovers, and the rhetoric of the officials all at the same time. What does this mean for our modern attitude? Well, we think more long term in standard measurements that we must learn, and we do this in tandem with others. It is almost time for this passenger train to leave the station, and the passengers are hurrying along the glistening sides of its coaches. The train will be pulled by this big streamlined diesel electric locomotive. Its engines are warming up, and inside the cab sits Mr. Schroeder, the engineer who has driven locomotives for many years. Giddens uses another phrase to describe this, the disembedding of social systems. These time and space tools mean we can organise things with people that we wouldn't be able to without them. We can say, this should happen there at this time. We should plan to do some activity at that point after the hands on the clock have span that many times before we could only do this in the village with the person we knew. Meet me at the oak tree tomorrow morning. But the time and space tools lift activity from the immediate social context. They disembed us. Giddens writes, the level of time-space distinction is much higher than in any previous period, and the relations between local and distant social forms and events become correspondingly stretched. I can communicate to someone that I've never met halfway around the world the exact time and place to meet anywhere else and at any other time. What does this mean for our modern attitude? We think more globally, stretched as Giddens says. We can think about planning with more people. is where Tom Haven works after school and on Saturday. Life today is too complex. People are too dependent upon each other. Jobs are too highly specialized. And that's why we depend on money as a quick and easy medium of exchange. How is money similar to clocks, maps, timetables and calendars and other disembedding tools? Well, in the same way, money is disembedded from time and place. It's an abstraction. Imagine a world with no money. A farmer friend gives you some crops and you register that he did you a favour. This involves trust. It involves knowing the person. It involves being local. This dynamic falls apart with strangers. Money depersonalises. However, like time and location, it requires standardisation. Everyone needs to be reading from the same script, understand the system, have trust that everyone will accept the currency. 
What does this mean for our modern attitude? We no longer think in terms of value of people, but filter everything through money, through commodities. Okay, so we're focusing a lot on abstraction using symbols, tokens, plans or machines to represent time, space and value so that we can standardise, that we can communicate with each other and plan together. We all use abstract systems. When you get on a plane, not only are you reliant on clocks and timings and maps and money, but there's a whole system of plans and blueprints that go on behind the scenes. Systems, the engines, and the control towers. Ridiculous. The airplane, symbol of our mastery of the skies, is spanning oceans and continents in ever dwindling hours, bringing new hope to the people of the world, new horizons to industry, and new careers to youth. For air transportation has proved itself a vital factor in the social and economic life of modern civilization. It is a rapidly expanding industry embracing many trades and professions, an industry employing thousands of persons. In fact, everyone makes use of experts, relying on what they do without asking too many questions. Professionals Lawyers, architects, doctors, pilots are consulted by lay people. I might understand and communicate some of the phenomenon that allow me to fly across the world, but abstract systems quickly become complex. I know what time the plane might leave. I know it uses engines of some sort. I know where on the map I'm going but the pilot knows the exact location, the airport knows the takeoff schedule, the engineer understands the blueprints of the engine, and so forth. The pre-moderns were experts in their locations. Everyone shared a general knowledge base. There are no need for specialists in specific areas. I'm an expert in my own house though. However, I know little about the building codes that built it, the medicine the doctor prescribes me, or the industrial process that provides my food. Whether we're getting on a plane or investing in a pension or using a bridge, making a phone call or turning on a tap, all these things are developed by abstraction by professionals who know more than us and require us to accept that the things are safe and will work. What does this mean? It means modernity requires faith, requires trust in people we don't know. It also requires us to always be learning, to choose an expert system to contribute to, to be the person in the know about something. And because no one can learn everything, it requires, more than ever, choice. It also means that it's not the individual that matters, but the overall routine, the set of processes, the abstract system. Getting on a plane is to take part in an activity that requires engineers, mining, weather predictions, food, suitcase production, coordination between countries. Everything is taken out of the hands of any one single individual or group. Our lives become truly global in that one thing on one side of the world affects many things on the other. Global events affect local events. We're pulled and pushed around like puppets. Giddens writes, The most intimate, say nursing a child, and the most distant, most general, say a reactor accident in the Ukraine, energy politics, are now suddenly, directly connected. It also affects what we think about, what we read in the news, what our conversations are. Gooden says, When the image of Nelson Mandela may be more familiar to us than the face of our next door neighbour, 
something has changed in the nature of our everyday experience. You can be closer to a person on the phone on the other side of the world than you are to the person in the same room not talking to you. What happens when these disembedding tools and abstract systems become complex? What happens when building a house is no longer as simple as finding local stones and building a shelter? Things start to require specialised knowledge, knowledge that we all don't have ourselves. This requires trusting that someone else knows what they're doing. Trust is integral to modern life. The Oxford English Dictionary describes trust as a confidence in or a reliance on some quality or attribute of a person or thing, or the truth of a statement. In fact, trust is everywhere. Cars, traffic lights, medicine, food, television, internet, taps, drugs, pharmaceuticals. None of us know how every part of all of these things work. Even doctors don't know how the pharmaceuticals are all manufactured. But what's the other side of trust? Risk. Trust always involves risk. It involves weighing up the risks and trusting that the outcome is worth the small risk in placing the procedure in someone else's hands. Like our disembedding tools and systems, trust involves an absence from local tradition the person or the process is not always there in front of you. Things are going on behind the scenes where you can't monitor them, see what's going on. We have no real idea what's going on with our money when we put it in a bank or a pension fund, but we trust that the professionals know what they're doing. Flying seems ridiculous, impossible, scary but we trust that the engineers and pilots understand what's going on more than we do. Modernity means that we must interact more than ever with strangers. Gidden says that the nature of modern institutions is deeply bound up with the mechanisms of trust in abstract systems. He continues that codes of professional ethics, in some cases backed by legal sanctions, form one means whereby the trustworthiness of colleagues or associates is internally managed. We trust professionals to manage every part of our lives. Haircuts, food, providing us with news, entertainment, so many things. Yet, if this trust is broken, for whatever reason, we might choose to not trust the system anymore, to keep our money under the mattress, drink bottled water instead of tap water, or even cut our own hair. The idea of risk as we know it is a very modern one. It was first used by European explorers navigating the globe and thinking about insurance and profit. Bookkeeping was integral weighing up costs and predicting gains. Risk became central in banking, investment and insurance, using mathematical modelling to think about probability and uncertainty. Traditional society was full of danger and unpredictability, but their idea of risk was very different. Traditional societies were circular, the seasons repeated in the same way. Modern society on the other hand, it's about moving towards something, improving, picking goals. That means choosing which risks to accept, who to trust, and which systems to use. Think about something as simple as choosing which job offer to accept. There are so many unknowns about the people, the way they work, what tools and software they use. In every choice, there are elements of weighing up which risks are smaller and what the relative gains might be. Modern life is a huge pros and cons list. OK, let's recap quickly. We use disembedding tools like clocks and rulers. We think more long term in standard measurements we must learn. And we do this in tandem with others. We think more globally. We think about planning with more people. This all helps us to synchronise our actions with others. We use money. We no longer think about swapping with or helping neighbours, but filter our relationships through money. 
we rely on disembedded abstract systems. These are sets of plans and rules and processes and blueprints that are professionalized in, for example, the architectural profession or the air travel profession. But finally, this requires trust and risk. It means modernity requires a faith in all of this. We leave it to the experts who might, if asked, communicate to us why we should use their services and why we should trust them. So how does this determine our attitude and psychology? Let's return briefly to our traditional life. What does it mean to be traditional? Well, as we've seen, it means accepting the routine and experience of previous generations, tilling the field in the same way, in a way that's embedded into time and space in their local area, in your immediate surroundings. Social life for traditionals is dominated by that simple circular process. But modern life is based at its heart on improvement, getting better, trying to progress. For our attitudes and psychologies, it requires constant reflection or reflexivity, examining, interpreting, absorbing new information. It requires choosing, based on calculations, whether subconscious or not, which expert systems to use and trust, and also which ones to join, to get a qualification in, to specialize in. Follow the crowd, get the big money. You make a pile and raise a pile, that makes another pile for you. Follow the crowd, we've reached a million, two million, five million. Watch us grow, going up. It's new, it's automatic, it dictates, records, seals, sterilizes, stamps and delivers in one operation without human hand. What am I bid? What am I offered? Sold, who's next? The people, yes. Follow the crowd to the empire city, the wonder city, the windy city, the fashion city. The people, yes. The people, perhaps. But is this all there is? Modern life also seems to be chaotic, unpredictable, an anxiousness-inducing time. Giddens also refers to a concept he calls ontological security. That is the confidence people have in the continuity and consistency of their self-identity, the reliability of the systems, codes, people and ideas around them, the security they feel getting on a plane, choosing a bank, trusting the news, deciding on a career. Who am I? When will the nuclear bomb hit? Is this job secure? Is this vaccine safe? Will this plane crash? Will my pension plan appreciate? These questions are bound up in trust. If the choices we make around them seem to work out, if we seem to become happier, more content, or if we seem to be progressing in some way, we have ontological security. What's the opposite of this? Angst, dread, ambiguity, undecidability? This is why existentialism emerged at the height of modernity. It expresses both anxiety, existential dread, and the possibility of order, security, and meaning in a secular world. The modern world promised to free individuals from dependence on the land and tradition, from an identity they inherited. It promised the possibility of self-creation. All of these things, these devices, expert systems and abstract ideas, ways to trust others, were optimistic. Yet in many ways they took as much out of our hands as they put in. Our faith in these modern ideas and systems relies somewhat on someone being in control, knowing what they're doing, having a plan. Do you feel that's the case? Maybe we're not modern at all. Maybe we're postmodern. Newspapers, magazines, mail and messages will be sent through the air at lightning speed and reproduced in the home. Well, talking of tools that shrink time and space, there are currently 395 people all around the world that I haven't met that make 
videos like this possible on Patreon. And I'm so, so grateful to every single one of them for letting me go out and make fun videos like this. And all I can pledge in return is to try my best at improving them, buying more equipment and, you know, trying to in improve the production quality and and the research and all the rest of it. So if you want to join those people and get access to scripts and naming credits and the Discord server and all of that, you can do so in the link in the description below. If not, like, share, uh, subscribe, hit that bell, hit that bell, hit that bell. And I think you can all probably guess what's coming next. I'll see you then.